tonight we're in Isaiah chapter 30, and our text begins in verse 8. Isaiah chapter 30, and looking down to verse 8, and we are in the portion of Isaiah where we are seeing God's judgment on God's people. Uh, previously, if you had read through uh, chapters all the way up to about chapter 25, you see that God really dealt with the nations of the earth. And as a reminder that God is not the God merely of those that are called by His name, namely Israel. He's not the God of merely those who have received Christ, His church. But God is the Creator and He is the God of all living. And whether they acknowledge Him or not, uh, He is the right, holy, just judge. And we saw in Isaiah one of the things that God wants from people is righteousness and judgment. It's really surprising, actually, if you were to ask what would be the preeminent characteristic of God? What would be the thing that God wants from people? You know, and, uh, you know, it's really interesting when you ask that question without looking at the Word of God, the answer, what does God want? Love. Yeah, love is what a lot of people say. But you know what the Bible says? God wants righteousness and judgment. Righteousness and judgment. And the pre dominant characteristic of God's holiness is His righteousness. It's a real attack, it's a real assault on God's personal character when any individual would accuse Him of not being righteous or not being holy. And a lot of times that attack is made by saying, well, God isn't love. And it's kind of surprising, isn't it? The evidence that's used for that has nothing to do with the fact that Jesus died for the sins of the world, but it has to do with the fact that God is either merciful and has not yet judged the wicked, or it has to do with the fact that God is righteous and does judge the wicked. And people say, well, if God's love, then why would He do that? And the reality of it is, is that God is a God of righteousness and judgment. Well, I want to look this evening at, uh, beginning at chapter 30 and verse 8, and uh, there are some great Bible doctrine and supporting truths that reflect the character of God that we'll see here. So beginning in verse 8 of Isaiah 30. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come, forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not. And to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word, and trust in oppression and perverseness, and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shard to take fire from the heart, or to take water withal out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses, therefore shall ye flee, and we will ride upon the swift, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain, and as an ensign and hill. Our Father, we do ask that you would help us with our minds to be alert and to understand Scripture this evening, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, this is an important passage of Scripture, and one of the ways that we look at it, even as we begin our study this evening, is looking at verse 8, when we see the command of God to the prophet Isaiah. And the command was to go and to write it before them in a table and note it in a book. You know, it's a little bit more of a, of a stress of the importance of a matter when it's written, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I think that, that we would all do well to be careful what we write. And uh, by that, what, what I would refer to would be what's so popular today. I don't know, uh, you know if social media is going to be here forever or if some people are going to cool on it. It's amazing to me because I can't comprehend... Uh, I can't comprehend internet friends. You know, to me, a friend is a person, you know, that you know. But there are people that have friends that they've never even met in person, you know. And, uh, 
don't take this the wrong way, don't be offended about it, but it doesn't mean the same to me when somebody says happy birthday to me on Facebook as it does when they write me a card. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And to me, it's just a little tough. But there are people that I know that happy birthday on Facebook is legit. It's real. It's not like cavalier or careless or meaningless. It's real. And uh, they, you know, it's like happy birthday and it means as much to them as somebody says it on the internet and so forth. It doesn't to me. Uh, but, you know, and anyway, be that being what it may, my, what I would say is I think we should be careful about what is written because of the permanence and uh, the record of it. And I'm not saying a person shouldn't want to go on record, but I mean, I'll tell you, people say some petty things sometimes, don't they? You know, just write something and, you know, and then all of a sudden they find out, wow, you know, that really got more, you know, sometimes I think they're looking for attention and then they realize, wow, that got more attention than I thought it would. And sometimes it makes them happy, but sometimes they realize, wish I hadn't said that, but it's written. It's done. It's, it's on the record. Um, I think we as Christians ought to be careful about that. I think we ought to commit ourselves, though, to written records, to written words. Just uh, two Sundays ago, Marathon Baptist actually signed a, signed a articles of it, not articles of a corporation, but they signed like a charter for their church where they committed to be members of that church. You know, and it's pretty neat to put your name down and say, I'm going to be part of this, and I'm committed to it. And, uh, you know, it's good to have a record of that. And, you know, it would be great if, it would be, wouldn't it be neat if, like, say, 200 years from now, somebody were to read that charter and see the record of people that had a burden to have a church in Key Marathon and invested their lives in being involved in that church. It would be good for a record. But this is a little bit of a different record that we see here in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 8. So if you've tuned out and tuned back in for just a minute, I want us to notice the, the, the uh, way that it's phrased. First of all, Isaiah is told by God Almighty, he said, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Now there are those individuals that, that think that God's plan for his word was not an eternal plan or a preserved work. My friend... This is a verse of the Bible that actually teaches biblical preservation, the doctrine of preservation. Isaiah is given to understand by God Himself that what he is writing is going to be forever and ever. If that's not in preservation, I don't know what is. You understand preservation, right? There's a difference between a book and God's Word. There's a difference between man's words and God's words. And when man writes what God has said, God said, I want this to be written down, and I want it to be on record forever and ever. Literally, the day will come when we will be eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ and these words will still be on record. And that's, that's all inspiring to me, especially when we, several thousand years later, are, are witnesses that what God said was true. These are, this is a passage or a verse of the Scripture that strengthens my faith. When God says, I want this to be a record forever and ever, and then thousands of years later when the people to whom it is written are long dead and forgotten, the record is still there. That's, that's all inspiring, isn't it? How that God preserves His Word. That's a miracle, isn't it? That God gave His Word and preserved it. It's miraculous. It's wonderful. But I'll tell you something else about it. It also is an indication in this verse that this is a transcendent truth. In other words, this isn't just something for the people of that day. This is something for people of every generation. And all of a sudden, not only is it all inspiring that God preserved His Word, that God said this is going to be written, forever and ever, and that God did what He said, which shows that not only that God is, God is able to preserve His Word and that God cares about things as such, but it's amazing to me that God shows that as a creator of us, He knows our character, knows what we naturally are. And so this is a record that God wants to be written as not only a witness against His people who have rebelled against Him and not worshipped Him, but this is a record that God wants people who are the same as those people to recognize. Every time I look at somebody and think, how could they do that? I'm getting to the place in life where I'm thinking, well, pretty easily, actually. How about you? You ever see somebody and you think, how could anyone do that? And then you realize, well, pretty easily, actually. It's, it's human nature. It's our character. It's amazing when we're close to the Lord what we would never do. It's amazing when we're not in fellowship with God what we're capable of. And I will say to you that anyone is capable of anything. And not every man that, man that think of these standing, take heed lest he fall, because that is the truth. And 
here we see a passage of Scripture that's written because God knows that we all have the characteristic to be like the people of Israel. So let's look at their characteristics. Let's look at what God says about them, and let's see it. Uh, and by the way, let me just say one last thing before we look at it. I'm encouraged because, you know, we're always down on generations. You, uh, you uh, what are you now? Millennials. You millennials that get mentioned all the time today. Did you know that I was Gen X and that Gen Xers got picked on? When they were, yeah, they, they did actually. I remember my pastor, the uh, Gen X, you know, and talking about the Gen Xers. And he was a baby boomer of all things, you know. And, uh, you know, talk about people that had, you know, generational just terrible generational tendencies and so forth. Did you know that generations are made up of people that have tendencies and that those tendencies are affiliated with the sin nature that's in every single person? And so it isn't just, oh, you know, it's, it's a generational thing. No, my friend, it is a thing that has to do with fallen sinful man, mankind. And this is a passage of Scripture that really casts light on the way we all are. Okay, so let's look at this rebellious people. Verse 9, God said this. He said that write down that this is a rebellious people. This is a rebellious people. What's a rebel? Well, a rebel is a person who will not bow. You could, you could describe a rebellion in a lot of different ways, but a rebel says no to God, and a rebel refuses to bow. A rebel refuses to bend his knee or to succumb to authority. And so that's a rebel. So God says about His people, the nation of Israel, that this is a rebellious people. Now, it would be one thing if I were calling them a rebellious people because they wouldn't bow to me, but we're talking about Creator God. We're not only just talking about a Creator God, we're talking about a God who has done very special things for the people, national Israel. You look at just the fact that without their even crying out to Him, the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt with a strong hand, brought into the promised land, and without even having to fight to take the land, were really given a land and a nation. That's a people that are privileged and ought to understand that they owe and are beholden to God. Isn't it so? In other words, God had done a lot for the children of Israel. And you know, we could say that God's done a lot for us, couldn't we? That would be quite an exaggerated understatement to say, well, you know, if I were to say today, God's done a lot for me. You'd say, and how? God's done more than a lot for you. Jesus died on the cross. God has made you who were lower than the angels to be adopted as His Son. The adoption thing that God has done for me is, is amazing. Not only that, but God has privileged me to have His Holy Spirit, that His Spirit would live in me. God answers my prayer and allows me to come into His presence. So for me to say something like, God's done a lot for me, you know, it would be an exaggerated understatement. And the same would be true for national Israel. So when we look at Israel and we say, well, this is a rebellious people, understand and know that, you know, people say, well, why should I bow to God? That's the question. Why, why does everything have to be God's way? Why is it only the Bible way? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God's done a lot and we're beholden to Him. You know, when Jesus died for our sins, you know, it's, it's reasonable for God to want us to not live in sin. Right? When Christ died for our sins, it is reasonable for God did not want us to, to live in sin. We're in that passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 12 right now where we are told that they all said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And it says, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable, isn't it, that God expects us to bow. But here's a people that say, no, God, I will not. No, God, I will not do things your way. No, God, I will not submit to your plan. And no, God, I do not trust you. There's a major trust issue here. See, national Israel doesn't have God's blessing because of idolatry, because of worshiping idols. And Jerusalem specifically is in great danger right now of being overtaken by the Babylonians. And so they're in, they have great concern. Now, they could do a couple of things. Here's what they could do. They could say, God, help us. God, help us. And bow and say, well, God, if you want captivity for us, we want captivity for us. But God, what we really want is you. And you know, God, God, when you, when you pray a prayer like that to God, would you say, not my will but yours? And God, whatever you want for me, it's amazing how merciful God is. How gracious God often will be. But these are people that say, I absolutely am not okay with going into captivity, and so we're going to go down to Egypt and get help. And God said, I want you going to Egypt. I delivered you from Egypt. Oh, we're going to go to Egypt and we're going to get help. 
Okay, so here's what the Bible says about them. Here are their characteristics of a rebellious ch people. The Bible calls them lying children. Children, in verse 9, that will not hear the law of the Lord. Okay, so they're individuals that don't want to hear what God has to say. I hate to say this, but it's true today. When I deal with believers who are not doing right when they're living in sin, that they don't want to open the Bible. To me, it ought to be as simple as, well, what does God say? And if God says it, you know, I like that God says it, I believe that that settles it. But there are people that say, yeah, um, and they want to argue maybe about why they're right, but they don't want to argue using the Scripture. In other words, they don't want to go to the Scripture and open it and find out. They, I, I just recently talked to somebody who wasn't doing right, and I said, you know, you really owe it to yourself to be honest enough to open the Bible and look at what God says before you make a decision to do the wrong thing. And he wouldn't open the Bible. You know, he, he did seek counsel with people that didn't want to know what the Word of God said. But I said, no, you know what? You, to be honest about it, we need to meet and open God's Word. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And that's normal. That's normal for, for people who are in rebellion to say, I don't want to know God's law. Uh, it's amazing how many lost people and how many saved people think they know God's Word but they're not willing to look at it and read it. And it's amazing, actually. Uh, I haven't done this in a while. I haven't had the opportunity to, I guess. But I had a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I, I've read the Bible. I know, you know, I, you can't tell me anything about the Bible. I, I've read, I've studied it all my life. And I just ask him something like, you know, well, tell me about Isaiah. Or tell me about, you know, uh, King Hezekiah. Or tell me about, you know, you mentioned one of the minor prophets. And it's kind of amazing. Uh, uh, uh. Well, you say you've studied the Word of God, but you, you probably have never even read most of it. You've probably sat through enough overwinded preachers preaching long sermons that you think he preached the whole Bible in one message, but he actually probably preached a verse, and that's about all you know of the Bible. The reality of it is it's a rebellious people, a lying children, the Bible says, and one of their characteristics was that they were not willing to hear the law of God. They did not want to hear the law of the Lord. Here's another characteristic. They picked their message. The Bible says in verse 10, which say to the seers, see not. Now a seer would be a person that God gives the vision to see the future. And here's what they said, don't tell me what you see. Don't, don't do what you do. <laughs> see not. And then the Bible says they say uh, to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. We're like this. This is us. Uh, I do it a lot of times. Usually when I'm fixing something or I'm trying to problem solve and I want it to be a simple, cheap answer. Anybody ever hope that it's the simple thing that's wrong? You know? And, uh, you know, you say to the mechanic, prophesy unto me <laughs> good things. Say unto the tech, you know, tell me what I want to hear. I, I don't know how many times I've said it and I, I half mean I say, give me good news. Give me good news. And this literally is what God's people who won't open His law, who are rebellious and who are lying people, say to the prophets. In other words, if there's a prophet that's going to tell them about captivity and that's the truth, they don't really care whether it's true or not. They don't want to hear it. My friend, we are in a bad place with regard to our relationship with God when we do not want to hear truth. We simply want the prophet to say things that are smooth and that are good and make us feel good. You know the problem with those things is they're not true. They're not true. Friend, if you're in sin, God's going to deal with you. You can't break God's law and have good results from it. I don't know how many people I know that think that they can do the same thing that's sin for everyone else and that they'll be the first person to have good outcome from the same thing. Listen, my friend, if it's sin, it'll have a bad outcome. It'll come with judgment. It'll come with consequences. It always has, and it always will. And so this would be true. And here are people that say, well, we want what we want to hear. You say, Pastor, how could people be like that? My friend, that is the, the predominant characteristic of today's church. It's the message a little different today, but about 15 years ago, I don't know how many people I met that were bragging on how good a church they went to, and they would say things like, if you come to our church, we're not all about doctrine. Now, for me, when, they, when you say we're not all about doctrine, I think, well, what's the point? 
doctrine's teaching, if you're going to go to church and you're not going to learn anything, what's the point? We're not all about doctrine. You know, we're not going to... And I'm just telling you something. That was an advertising... That was a talking point some years back. In other words, if you come to our church, we'll be careful that you won't learn anything. Well, this is exactly what these people are asking for. They're saying, prophesy unto us smooth things. In other words, you can come and hear the prophet, and he's going to tell you about how things are going to work out. How you can be a better you. How you can elevate yourself simply by believing. And how you can... And the problem is, is that it just isn't God's message. Just tell us what we want to hear, and they'll pay dearly for it. They'll pay, what, they'll pay for it. But the fact of the matter is, my friend, that was the characteristic of Israel. They said, we don't want to hear from God. We want to hear good things. We want to hear positive things. Does, does negativity get you down? It does me. I'm an optimist. And uh, I'm going to tell you, an optimist, I believe, is a realist. Just to be honest with you. I, I, a pessimist is not a realist. Things are never as bad as pessimists think that they are. They are. They, and they're, they're just not honest about it. And the fact of the matter is just because you can't see how everything is going to work out is, doesn't mean that everybody's going to die. You know, it doesn't, doesn't mean that things aren't going to work out. And uh, to me, a pessimist has a real spiritual issue. I'm not even joking about this. A person is negative all the time. I can't stand it. I can't stand when somebody feels like it's their calling to tell you what's wrong with something. You know, you understand what I'm talking about this evening? In other words, you're trying to serve the Lord, you're trying to do things in ministry, and people come and tell you why it's not going to work. Well, you know something? Then my life has no purpose because I'm called to serve the Lord. And if it's not going to work, if nobody's going to get saved, if people aren't going to come, if things aren't going to change, if whatever, then it's all a waste of time. Why are you here? That's what I want to say when people tell me things aren't going to work or tell me things are wrong. I think some people think that that's a spiritual gift is to tell you things that are negative. So let me just qualify for this evening by saying that I do not believe in negativity, but I do believe in truth. I do believe in truth. And if something's sin, I need to know it's sin. I don't need somebody to tell me, well, you know something, I don't want to hurt his feelings and tell him he's wrong. My friend, if I'm wrong, I need to know I'm wrong. Period. And so there needs to be a balance in it, doesn't it? Now, let's look at why it is that truth is better than error. Could we do that this evening? Why it is that truth is better than error. Let's look at, at what these individuals say. Here's what God says they say as well. Verse 11, Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from the forest. In other words, God, leave me alone. God, just leave me alone. Stop bothering me. I don't want you. Here's what God says. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness. What is a lie? Is a lie is a lie a positive thing or is it a negative thing actually, honestly? It's a, it's a negative thing. If somebody believes something that isn't true, my friend, it'll never help them. It'll never help them. You know, you have all kinds of uh, you know, stories that are written that you know talk about somebody that just believed something that wasn't true and in the end it worked out well for them because they believed something that was good. My friend, if it's not true, it's, there's no benefit. It's only in a story like that that things work out well. The reality is, is believing a lie will lead you on the wrong path. And so, these individuals, the Bible says in verse 12, it says, you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. Literally, these are people that are doing wrong and they don't want to be told that they're wrong. They've done things like they're not supposed to sell their land, they've sold the land, they're not supposed to move the landmarks and they've moved the landmarks. They're supposed to uh, take care of the fatherless and the widows, and they haven't. They've oppressed the fatherless and the widows. They take advantage of their own countrymen. They, they rip off each other. And they like it. They like to play the game of dog-eat-dog. Dog. Uh, I've learned some years ago uh, that I'm not a match for a dishonest person in a bargain and a deal. You ever see some, you know, do a deal with someone and you realize that they're not honest. You know what I try to do now when I realize somebody isn't dealing honestly? I cut and run. If I've already invested in it, I figure I lost that much, but I'm done with you, and so I'm ahead. And that's the reality. But you know, there are a lot of people, they always, well, I too can play that game. And they try to see if they can rip off the crook. You know, it's two thieves. And that literally is the mindset here. Is, you know, that guy's dishonest, but I don't mind so much because two can play that game. 
If he knows how to put his hand on the scale, I know how to put a weight on the other side. My dad and I were one time at a, um, at a, uh, a, a uh, recycling yard where you weigh when you where you weigh scrap, and we had a recycling center, but we were, I think we were taking in some brass or something that we bought and uh, selling it to a friend of my dad's, and we were behind the counter because he was a friend. And before when we were had the truck on the scale, we were weighing it, <laughs> and my dad went over to the scale. I didn't know what he did, but there was a magnet on the left side of the scale, one of the old scales. You know, that you slide the you know you slide the weights on. There was a magnet on this side. Which, you know, on a, several tons, you know, of weight, you know, a little white magnet, actually, I don't know if it's worth a few hundred pounds or whatever, but there was a magnet here. So my dad took the magnet off the scale, and he was going around the office with it, just playing with the magnet while he's chatting with the guy that owned the scale. And he's just checking to see, oh, is that metal, you know, whatever. And then when he got done, he put it on the opposite side of the scale. And so, you know, you can see... And I didn't notice it, but I did, thinking about it later, you can see the guy thinking, oh man, that's going to cost me, because he was weighing our stuff. When we got done, you know, our, when we left, my dad said, you notice I put his magnet on the opposite side of the scale? He was ripping people off. He's putting a magnet here so that it'll weigh less, and he said, I put it on the opposite side, and the thing is that the lever, you know, the weight is this way, so it's weighed a lot more on this side than it did on that side. Now, the sad part about it is he probably ripped off so many people that, you know, having one person, you know, get get it to go the other way doesn't matter. My point is is that there are people that just like to play that game. It's just a fun game to them, you know. It's like, well, you know, you win some, you lose some, but I think I win more than I lose. Lying, dishonest people. And that was the characteristics of God's people. My friend, I'm not speaking anti-Semitically this evening to say that that is a characteristic of God's people, the Jew today. Isn't it true? It really is sad. But it's actually a it's actually a tendency to, to admire dishonesty, to actually have an admiration for it. And uh, God hates it. And people that are called by His name don't like it. You know what? There are a lot of Christians who are exactly the same way. A lot of Christians have a tendency to think, well, you know, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, my friend. No, 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 no. People that depend on God can depend on God. They don't have to depend on wits and cunning and dishonesty. You know, you can be honest and deal with dishonest people and not know it, and God will still take care of you. I have been taken great advantage of before, and I'm here just to tell you I'm okay. I've had people just really rip me off before, and guess what? I'm okay. Why? Because God's good. God will take care of me. I don't need, I don't need to depend on, on dishonesty in myself to be able to survive in a dishonest world. Here are people that have a generational tendency of dishonesty. The Bible says this, Therefore this iniquity, verse 13, shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. Literally their characteristic tendencies are going to be what actually causes their own demise. Their behavior is what's going to be actually the cause of their destruction. In verse 14 the Bible says, And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shard to take fire from the hearth or to take water withal out of the pit. Isn't that too bad? Here are people that are doing things that are not right in order that they can hold on to things in their possessions. And God says, everything you have is just going to be destroyed. My friend, I'll just tell you something. Doing God things God's way works. But our problem is we don't believe God, do we? At times we don't think that, you know, if I do right, God won't take care of me. My friend, God will always take care of His children. And he'd done marvelous things. He literally had made it so that national Israel, particularly under the days of King Solomon, was the talk of the nations with regard to God's blessing. It's like you've got to go see Solomon and see what God has done and what God is doing. It's just you wouldn't believe it unless you saw it. And you hear people that say, you know what, I better look out for myself because I don't trust God to take care of me. Moving forward, I want to see God's response. Verse 15, here's our conclusion. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. Now, friend, here's what God wanted from His people. He wanted them just to return and say, okay, God, I'm wrong. You know, that's one of the best things you can make. One of the best two words you can learn. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I mean, you'd be amazed at how it will mend and heal relationships. 
to simply say to somebody, I'm wrong. And actually say, here's what's wrong. This is what I said that was wrong. This is what I did and it was not right. So I want to tell you something, you know. There's nothing wrong with getting to be really good at saying I'm wrong. Nothing wrong with getting to be good at saying I'm wrong. It's amazing. It doesn't hurt your credibility when you're wrong to say I'm wrong. You're wrong. It hurts your credibility when you're wrong and you won't get ranked. And here are people that God says just return to me. If you will just, instead of clamor, instead of trying to make your way, if you'll just choose quietness and rest, I'll be your strength. What a deal. What a deal that is. Christian, how about it? How about just saying, hey, you know what? I'm not right, but I'm going to make the choice of quietness and, God's, and rest. I'll let God's strength be my strength. And the Bible says, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength and you would not. You know, the problem is, is that usually it's, it's a sinking ship and we want to go down with the ship. We think there's something noble about sticking to what we started with when it was wrong or evil. Friend, I'm going to just tell you something. If you're on a sinking ship and it's sinking because of sin, get off it. Let it go down, don't go with it. And this is exactly what God is saying to the nation of Israel, saying, get right. Just get right. Just get right. You know, it's pretty simple to get right. For a person who is under the, under the blood of Jesus Christ, it's a matter of confessing your sins. The Bible says if we would confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, I'm wrong. I'm asking forgiveness. I want to be right. I'm getting off of this sinking ship. It's pretty simple. But here's what they said. But Jesus said, no, for we will flee upon horses. No, we'll just get a really fast horse, then they won't be able to catch us. And God said, but they'll have, they'll have fast horses too. He says, therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. Think you can escape God, His hand of judgment. Not in your life, my friend. Seems as though, you know, there are a lot of Jonah mindsets out there where I'm going to get on a ship to go the opposite direction. My friend, God's everywhere. You can go anywhere and you won't escape God. Boy, it would really help us when we start to get ourselves into sin and into scrapes to just say, you know what, I'm not, this isn't going to end well. I'm not going to get to a place where God doesn't know where I'm at. And so I better just get out of this place and get to where I'm supposed to be, the place of quietness and rest. And here's the end result. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall you flee, till you be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign upon a, on a nail. God said you're just going to be powerless. You know something? When it comes right down to it, running isn't fun. Running isn't fun, is it? Well, I can run really fast. You know, it'd be nice to just be able to stand your ground and be able to have God defend you. And living a life this way, yeah, they say, well, I like the chase. But you know something? You won't like the kid and caught part of the chase. And there are a lot of people that are living a rat race. They're like a hamster on a wheel. Just running and running and running and running and running and running. The problem is, is that you're never going to get away from God. And secondly, there's no kind of way to live. How about a Christian? Do you have characteristics that are parallel to Israel? Is it hard for you to say, God, I'm wrong? You're rebellious? Do you have a rebellion where you won't bend your knee, you won't bow to God? Do you have a mindset that says, I'd rather hear what I want to hear than to hear the truth? Well, it's us, isn't it? It's the way we are. And God urges these people that they ought to be quiet and their confidence should be their strength. And quietness would be their confidence and their strength. When's the last time you decided instead of trying to solve your problems that usually if we're honest about it because of the things that we did that are wrong, when's the last time instead of trying to fix the problems, you just stopped and said, God help me and let Him be your strength? You know, if we make that a habit and a practice, you'd be amazed at where you'd be at and what God could do. Sometimes we think, oh, I got myself in this situation and I'm going to get myself out. <laughs> My friend, you got yourself in the situation you can't touch and trust you. I got myself in this situation and only God can get me out. God help us to believe you and rest in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take prayer requests.